Counsel, are you ready to proceed? Very well. Mr. Davies, on behalf of the appellant, this is case number 66474, Berry v. State. Thank you, Your Honor. If it pleases the Court, my name is Lynn Davies. I'm appearing here with our Nevada Counsel, John Wendland, and my partner, Craig Coburn. It's a great honor to appear before this Court. And while we are delighted to be here, we also find it unfortunate that so much time has passed since we were before the District Court in Las Vegas. And if, as we assert in this matter, Mr. Berry is innocent, he's now spent another year and a half in prison improperly since we filed our petition for habeas corpus. I'm going to try to move properly to what I see as some of the key issues in this matter. But if the Court would accommodate me for a moment, I'd like to make a couple of prefatory remarks. It seems to me that in our criminal justice system, it is absolutely essential that we make sure that only guilty people are incarcerated. And if that does not occur, if the wrong person is incarcerated, then there is a huge amount of damage that occurs not only to the individual, but to the entire system. It erodes confidence in the system to have the wrong person in prison. It erodes confidence in the system fundamentally as a bedrock matter not to have the right person held accountable for the crime. In this, it seems that we ought to be able to go to almost any length to make sure that does not happen. And as indicated in the Schlup case, an individual has an overriding interest in making sure that he's not put in prison improperly. Here we are simply asking the Court for a little court time to flesh out these claims, to see if the new evidence that we've asserted is not in fact good evidence, that it might not in fact change the result in this case. The countervailing arguments do not seem to be very persuasive or very strong. That we shouldn't even be allowed to go to the next step and ask for an evidentiary hearing before the Court. It seems that the interest of justice may be lost here in the interest of trying to preserve a conviction or trying to be tough on crime, even at the risk of having the wrong person in prison. Mr. Davis, would you explain step by step, however, how we get around the procedural bars and the history in this case? Absolutely, Your Honor. I believe that there are two ways that we can get past the procedural bars. I don't just believe that. Actually, there are two ways to get past the procedural bars. First, on each of the statutory time bars that have been asserted under 34.726, 34.810, there is a standard of our being able to establish good cause. That's expressly stated in those statutes. And then under 34.800, it's a similar standard as to whether or not the petitioner could not have known with the exercise of reasonable diligence the newly discovered evidence. So essentially, prong one on each of those procedural bars is one that pertains to good cause and what the petitioner could have done reasonably under his circumstances. I will mention briefly and then come back to that, that in addition to that, if we can establish actual innocence and a fundamental miscarriage of justice, that trumps all of the procedural bars. And in order for us to move forward to the next stage, the evidentiary hearing on claims of actual innocence, all we have to establish is a colorable claim that this evidence, if true, in fact would warrant an evidentiary hearing. Coming back to the good cause, the district court in this matter did not make any specific factual findings regarding good cause. It is our position that he made inappropriately a number of factual findings and that he did in fact weigh the evidence and determine credibility, but that was as to the substance of the evidence as opposed to the issue of reasonable cause. While you're touching on that, I don't see this in the briefs, but it may have eluded me. Are you asking in the event this court were to reverse and grant an evidentiary hearing that it be assigned to a different judicial officer because of the fact finding already made? 
That would certainly be our preference, Your Honor. Justice Pickering, as I understand and as I read the ruling from Judge Villani in this matter, he seems to have pretty strong feelings about the case. He's already made up his mind. It seems that as a practical matter, it might be something of an exercise in futility to send this matter back to the same judge. I don't mean to derail your argument. I want to make sure that I've answered Judge Sato's question, though, about the – Justice Sato's question about good cause. Judge Villani did make some determinations about good cause, but they're not based on factual findings. He basically just reached the conclusion that perhaps Mr. Marlowe should have come forward sooner with some of this evidence. I don't know how he could do that. The first problem is that he – Mr. Berry is reliant entirely upon volunteer help to do anything in this matter. He can't direct or personally do any activity. Second, though, he cannot dictate when someone chooses finally to give a statement as the confession from Stephen Jackson, the sin dog in this matter. He made that confession when he made it. There was no way to make him give that confession earlier. He chose when he was going to do it. Similarly, Mr. Iden recanted when he chose to recant. Once some of that information was available, then further digging occurred, in fact, once again by volunteer help to get the MAC affidavit as additional support. So he really could not have done anything in the exercise of reasonable diligence or – and he had good cause for not being able to get that information earlier. It simply was not available to him. Now, Judge Volani seems to reach the conclusion that Mr. Berry previously asserted that sin dog was the actual murderer, and so that information was available. But we're not talking about the information. We're talking about the evidence. The evidence consists of the affidavits and declarations that were subsequently made, and those simply were not available until later. I would come back to the other point, though, that as a second prong of attack on these procedural bars, we have asserted actual innocence and a fundamental miscarriage of justice. In particular, if one takes the Iden affidavit, he has now come forward with information to say that the police and the prosecutors coached him, prodded him, offered him incentives, paid for his travel, told him who the right – told him facts about the murder, and basically suborned perjury in order to produce his testimony at trial. Now, at this juncture, whether that sounds credible or not – and actually to us it does sound credible, but whether or not, it's our job simply to make a colorable showing that that evidence, if true, could lead to a different result. I would ask this Court to consider for a moment what a new trial in this case might look like. We would go in with the evidence that was there before. Essentially, Mr. Berry was convicted as the person responsible for this crime based on eyewitness testimony and Mr. Iden's statement that Mr. Berry confessed while in the jail. So now at a new trial, we would have first and foremost a confession by Sindob Jackson where he says, I actually did it, and here are the details of how I did it and why I did it. That's one piece of information the jury would have. They would now have this eyewitness testimony, which I would assert is extremely shaky and suspect, and there is a strong overlying indication throughout this matter of prosecutorial misconduct in coaching these witnesses to say what they did. But let me give you one example because I have such limited time. But Mr. Lamora, one of the eyewitnesses, he was one of the people who was at the bar next door. He had had 12 beers during the prior three hours, admittedly. He ran out, says he saw something. He saw somebody in the parking lot. He saw somebody coming out of the restaurant. When he was interviewed later, he couldn't really say who it was. He's given a photo lineup of six people. He picks two of them as possibilities. 
Later at trial, to cut through this, on cross-examination, he was asked if he ever actually saw the face of the person coming out of the restaurant. And he conceded that he had not. He expressly stated that on the record at trial. I didn't see the face. Then there was an effort made by the prosecutor to rehabilitate him and get him to change his story on redirect, which he did. And by the end of his testimony, he was asked, so how certain are you that this person was Mr. Berry on a scale of 1 to 10? And he said, certain, a 10. Now, that's the kind of eyewitness testimony that came forth. On a retrial of this matter, we would have that eyewitness testimony subject to attack. We'd have the recantation from Mr. Iden. We would have Sindog's testimony, and we would have Mack confirming that Sindog confessed back at the time this happened. It would be an entirely different trial. It's almost impossible to say that we could not get a different result under those circumstances. I've reserved some time. Talk to you later. Thank you so much, Mr. Davis. Mr. Burton. Good morning to the court, to counsel. May it please the court, my name is Chris Burton for the Clark County District Attorney's Office on behalf of the respondent. Your Honors, in this case, the petitioner's position includes a misunderstanding of the applicable legal principles, a misrepresentation or a misunderstanding of the trial record, and several logical fallacies. Schlepp v. Dello is where we start. Schlepp v. Dello is the United States Supreme Court case that gives us the actual innocence standard. It's their burden to prove that more likely than not, no reasonable juror in light of the new evidence would come back with a verdict of guilty. However, Schlepp v. Dello actually is also our ending point, because Schlepp v. Dello was an affidavit case. There was no evidentiary hearing in Schlepp v. Dello. So the United States Supreme Court actually gives us guidance on how the actual innocence standard applies when there is a request for an evidentiary hearing, exactly what petitioner requested in this case. And they say, quote, that the district court is to assess the probative force of the newly discovered evidence, the affidavits before it, in comparison to the evidence provided at trial. They explicitly reject the standard that petitioner would have this court adopt, and that is a motion for summary judgment where we presume the evidence is credible, where we presume their affidavits are more probative than the evidence at trial. The United States Supreme Court explicitly said that is not the appropriate standard when you're considering on whether there should be an evidentiary hearing. You examine the probative force of the affidavits, and they even continue to say the court may consider how the timing of the submission, the petition for rid of habeas corpus and the newly discovered evidence, and the likely credibility of the affiants, the people who wrote the affidavits, bear on the probable reliability of that evidence. That's because actual innocence is a standard that requires a weighing of probabilities. What would the jury probably have done in light of this newly discovered evidence? In light of a complete and utter confession. In light of Mr. Jackson's confession. Accompanied by several witnesses who essentially acknowledged their untruthfulness. What do you think a reasonable jury might do? Well, I would dispute that there were several witnesses that indicated that they were untruthful. There's only one. It's Mr. Iden. And if we want to talk about his recantation, there is an absolute problem with his recantation. It is that it is contradicted by all of the evidence in the record. Not just Mr. Iden's testimony at trial, but everyone's testimony at trial that had anything to say about Mr. Iden. Specifically, what Mr. Iden says happened in his recantation is that the detectives saw him talking to the defendant in the holding cell. They approached him. They said, we want you to say that the defendant confessed. We'll help you out with your negotiation, with your pending cases, and we'll make sure you have a suspended sentence. Here's what actually happened. The detectives testified that the cases were negotiated. Mr. Iden's cases were negotiated before they ever had contact with Mr. Iden. Mr. Iden's defense attorney, Pete Christiansen, a deputy public defender at the time, testified at trial that, indeed, Mr. Iden's cases were negotiated before there was any contact with the detectives. And that there was no change in the negotiations after the detectives met with Mr. Iden. The jail personnel testified that Mr. Iden 
was put in the holding cell 30, excuse me, 24 hours after the defendant. So there's no reason the detectives would be waiting around for 24 hours to see if the defendant would actually talk to somebody, and then lo and behold, Mr. Iden pops in 24 hours later. There's multiple witnesses that testify that the negotiations remained the exact same after Mr. Iden met with the detectives. The only thing that changed was that the detectives agreed they would speak with the sentencing judge, which happened to be Judge Mopp and the trial judge in this case, who also said on the record, yes, I remember in passing that that happened. Mr. Christiansen says the same thing. The record from Mr. Iden's sentencing belies or contradicts his claim that he received. Eliminate that testimony. Tell me about the actual... The actual Mr. Sindog or Mr. Jackson's confession. Fair enough, Your Honor. If we look at Mr. Jackson's confession, what the district court did and what Schlepp v. Dello tells the district court to do, and this court tells the district court to do in Pellegrini, is you look at the affidavit and you presume that's their factual allegation. I will call Mr. Jackson to the stand. This is what he's going to testify to. Let's presume that that's exactly what's going to happen. We're going to call Mr. Jackson to the stand. His testimony is going to mirror what happened in the affidavit. Then you look at what does the trial evidence show. And there are problems with Mr. Jackson's confession. Specifically, there are significant contradictions between physical evidence that cannot be disputed, that cannot be impeached, and Mr. Jackson's confession. The district court pointed out one, and that is specifically the location of the victim's body. Mr. Jackson, in his affidavit, claims that the victim was trying to open a safe that was located in a cabinet in the front of the Carl's Jr. underneath a drink station. However, the victim's body is found in the back of the restaurant, and there is a bullet hole in the cabinet door, which means that when that bullet was shot into the safe, the cabinet doors were closed. No one was trying to access that safe when that bullet was fired. And the victim is clear in the back of the restaurant. You also have what Mr. Jackson claims is he comes into the restaurant, he starts robbing, he has the manager, he's trying to open the safe, and a customer comes in, Mr. Guerrero. And that customer starts to walk in, then recognizes something strange is going on, and walks back out. Mr. Jackson, in his affidavit, says, this is when I start to get nervous. This is when I start to worry about the crime being detected, and in the resulting confusion, the gun accidentally goes off, and he dies while he's trying to open the safe. However, that is contradicted by the fact that you have at least two employees, Ray Metz and a woman named Jessica, who the robber has contact with before he ever gets to the victim. He actually pulls a gun on Ray Metz and starts getting money from the till. Isn't that temporarily outside the affidavit? I mean, to me, respectfully, the stuff that led up to the shooting might logically not be included in a declaration, just as things that come after. And looking at this, I'm wondering if an evidentiary hearing wouldn't flush those issues out more satisfactorily. If I understand the court's question correctly, it's that the focus is the murder. However, the affidavit actually says, I was in Vegas, I was high on drugs at the time, and I committed robberies. That's context. That's context. And so he starts from the beginning of the robbery. I don't think it's temporarily outside of his affidavit. But he completely omits Ray Metz. And his claim that he first becomes nervous about the crime being detected only upon the customer coming in and then leaving is belied or contradicted by the fact that Ray Metz and Jessica have already fled the scene and, in fact, have already called 911. So it makes no sense for Mr. Jackson to claim that it's only after the third person leaves the scene that he becomes nervous that his crime is going to be detected. It makes no absolute sense whatsoever. There are several omissions from Mr. Jackson's affidavit that should be held against the petitioner, just like omissions in the Pellegrini case were held against Mr. Pellegrini. There were omissions that this court said, even if you prove that you suffer from multiple personality disorder, there is nothing in the declaration itself that says that because of your multiple personality disorder, you were legally insane at the time of the crime. Similarly, there are omissions in Mr. Jackson's affidavit that should be held against him. 
first and foremost, Ray Metz, not only because she's omitted entirely, but because his affidavit actually contradicts her presence and flight from the crime scene. You have no getaway car. You have no statement whatsoever about how he escaped from the scene. But that would be at the tail end. I mean, honestly, you read his affidavit, and it looks like it's, here's context. I was high. I was in Las Vegas, and murder. I could see a witness omitting in a declaration, but not under cross-examination or in live testimony, the beginning and the end of that tale and not having it be irretrievably in contradiction. Well, but he does go all the way to the point where he is going on his way to California, throwing parts of the gun yeah. out the window. So we have him going from the beginning to the end, and the middle parts are left out, key middle parts. And that's what the district court looked at. And those omissions should be held against the petitioner. We look at the evidence at trial. We look at the affidavits. We presume that's what they're going to testify to on the stand, and that's what we look at when we decide is an actual innocence shown. Should we know. dissect, should we be influenced at all by the fact there are three affidavits and not just one? It, it might be a closer case if all you had were Iden's affidavit or all you had were um, the woman from California who said Sindog confessed or all you had was Sindog's. I mean, people make things up and they lie. But it becomes less credible when you have three liars who were, apart from eyewitnesses, really the main evidence at trial. And, and here's what I was just about to say, was there's an important point to be made here about the logical fallacies when we look at Mr. Jackson's confession. And that is that Petitioner has always cast this as an either or. And it's a false dichotomy. It is not the case that it's either Sindog or the defendant. In fact, the evidence presented at trial is that they were both involved, that it was Sindog and the defendant. The same tip that Petitioner relies on saying, the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department should have done more to investigate because here's a tipster who says Sindog's involved. That same tip said that DeMarlo Berry was involved, that Sindog was the getaway driver, that DeMarlo Berry was the gunman, and that a third person, Blue, was the lookout. So we have this false dichotomy where it's not an either or, it's an and. And we also have a red herring where at great length in their briefs, and even before your honors, they stand here and they say that there are problems with the identification evidence at trial. However, in their briefs, they cite to various witnesses, Mr. English, Mr. Bukowski, and Mr. Uh, Ariano, who did not testify at trial, who had voluntary statements, so they were known to the defense, known to the parties, but did not testify at trial. So when we look at what is the evidence at trial versus what is the newly discovered evidence, these three people and their suspect descriptions have no place in that debate, have no place in that context of what is happening here. It's an entire red herring. Who did testify at trial is Ray Metz, saying between 1 and 10, I'm an 11, certain that that is the person who held me up. He was 2 to 3 feet away from me. He was holding a gun in my face. That's the man. She testified like that at the preliminary hearing. She had a photographic uh, lineup where she identified, where the police officers testified that what they said was, suspect may or may not be present. You tell us. These were all conducted independently. They were conducted sometimes with the officers actually turning their back while the witness looks at the photographic lineup. These were people who, independent of each other, four eyewitnesses, looked at a photographic lineup and selected DeMarlo Berry's uh, picture. Five witnesses, so four plus an additional witness, looked at him at either preliminary hearing and or at trial and said, that's the person I saw inside the Carl's Jr. So if you, you have... If you take out... Um... Iden, and you put in uh, Jackson's testimony and his, the corroborating witness for oh, him. Mac. Yeah, Mackey. Um, the evidence against Mr. Berry is what? If you take out Mr. Iden's testimony at trial, you mean? Yes. The five eyewitnesses that testified, this is the person that robbed us. You also have... Including the, the 12 beer guy, but Metz was, she saw him in the... 
restaurant. Correct. And here's what I will say about Mr. Lamora, who had 12 beers in the course of, I think, five hours before he saw. He said he was not intoxicated. And I would say that Ms. Nett said she was absolutely not at the bar. But do we have anything besides the eyewitness testimony? We also have, and I think this is important, we have defendant's flight. Defendant testified at trial he knew he was a wanted man. He knew he was wanted for this Carl's Jr. robbery. And he stayed on the run for almost up to two weeks before the police actually had to surround his house and threaten him with canine involvement before he came forward. So we have significant evidence of identification outside of Mr. Iden. Quite frankly, the way it reads in the trial testimony. But contradicting that, I mean, you had a canine officer, did you not, the night of the murder that came up to him and asked him what he was doing. There was some encounter between him and a Metro canine team. And I know that there is a citation to that in the brief. What I will say in the trial record is that the canine officer, and I'm talking about a different canine episode. Right, I understand that. Okay, so the canine officer said, yeah, I had an interaction with two black males. I can't say whether one of them was the defendant or not. I can't identify either of those two males. And that that happened a significant period of time after the alleged robbery, something like an hour to an hour and a half after the alleged robbery. And that Blue, the person who was, according to the tipster, fingered as the lookout, lived at that motel. So we have the defendant admitting that he's at the scene. And if you believe him and that he had this interaction with this canine officer an hour and a half to two hours after he committed the robbery, he's also at Blue's address, who is tipped as the lookout in this case. So we have him not only corroborating evidence of being at the scene, but corroborating evidence that he is with other alleged co-conspirators shortly after the crime. You have no fingerprint evidence or other physical evidence at the scene that supports the presence of Mr. Berry, do you? No, and there is no physical evidence that supports the presence of the scene of Mr. Jackson either. Fingerprints were examined to both of these individuals with negative results. So we don't have any physical evidence tying either of these two individuals to the scene. What we have are testimonial evidence. And with that, Your Honor, I'll submit. Thank you so much, Counsel. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Thank you. What I'm hearing from the State is a desire to have this Court weigh all of the evidence right now, just as they urged Judge Volani to weigh the evidence previously. We need to remember the procedural status of this case. We filed a petition. We asked for an evidentiary hearing. We got stopped right there. We haven't even gone to the next step. A lot of this could be addressed at the evidentiary hearing, and a court with more time to review everything could look at all the evidence, old and new, in making a determination about what to do next. But we have not gotten to that step yet. So to reel it back for a moment, where we are is at a point where all we have to do under either the petition for habeas corpus to get an evidentiary hearing or to overcome the procedural bars on the claim of the time bars under the claim of actual innocence. Under either one of those two, it's essentially the same standard, that we basically have to put on some evidence, some new evidence, that if it's treated as true, might very well change the outcome. Mr. Davis, this goes back a ways, but in the original conviction, was Mr. Berry convicted under a theory of felony murder or under a separate theory of first-degree murder? My understanding is it was first-degree murder. If I'm correct, Your Honor, procedurally what happened was when there was this 11-to-1 hung jury, he was offered the opportunity to not get the death penalty if he would accept the 11-to-1 verdict. So I understand it was first-degree. The charging sheet I saw said murder, so I believe that's the case, Your Honor. Thank you. In any event, coming back to what I was saying a moment ago, we either need to show on the actual innocence claim a colorable showing of some evidence or on the petition for writ of habeas corpus to get an evidentiary hearing, it has to be something more than naked allegations that are not belied by the record. What do you say, though, to his argument that Schlup was in a, or Schlup, I'm not sure how to say it, was in a procedurally similar posture to your case, and that called for a much more active review of the credibility of the evidence? Well, Schlup is a U.S. Supreme Court case, and in that case the court said 
without any new evidence of innocence, even the existence of a conceitedly meritorious constitutional violation is not in itself sufficient to establish a miscarriage of justice. In this court, we have the cases Bejarno, Stis, Pellegrini, and Bennett, all of which support the idea of simply a colorable showing of evidence, which if true, treated as true, might result in a different outcome in this case. So, you know, as much as I'm a trial attorney, I don't do criminal work typically, maybe you already know that, but I'd love to get into a trial and talk to some of these witnesses and see how this evidence can be flushed out and do the same thing at an evidentiary hearing. I think we have a much better chance of getting to the truth that way. And again, you know, we're here in this court with 30 minutes total to argue, and it's just not the same situation where we can send this back and actually allow a judge some time to flush out these claims. But a few key points in response to some of what I heard was, first of all, the omissions in Sindok's affidavit, his confession, omissions by definition really are not an inconsistency and they don't contradict the record. And as you indicated, Justice Pickering, there's probably an explanation for that, and some of that is set forth, I'll remind you, in the two additional affidavits that we submitted from Ms. Fossey and Ms. Anderson. They explained why Sindok was reluctant to implicate his brother, for example. That's why he didn't name the getaway driver, and that's why some of the other facts are not in there. But it's just the fact that when you write up an affidavit, you're not going to flush out as many facts as you might do otherwise. The tipster, you know, that called in did not testify at trial. Four of the five eyewitnesses changed their stories from their initial statements to trial. There's a lot to talk about here. You take the totality of this, and it simply cries out that there has been an injustice here and the wrong man is in prison. We submit it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Burton. This matter will be taken under advisement.